I invite you guys to turn with me in your Bibles for our scripture reading, for our sermon text this morning. We are once again this week in the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, and we're going to read together verses 25 to 32. I ask you to please stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. Reading from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 25 through 32. This is God's holy word for us, his people. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. This is God's Holy word for us as people. Let's ask him to bless our time in this word. Lord Jesus, we are indeed in awe of you today. And we want nothing more than to see you stand forth in your glory and power and beauty and compelling truth from your word today. Show us the truth of your word. Write it deep upon our hearts so that we can go home from this place changed conformed just a little more into the image of our Savior Jesus. We ask it for his sake and in his name. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Last week, I made the point that the Doctrine of the Trinity is a gospel doctrine. There are potential clues and indications in the Old Testament, but the Trinity is primarily revealed in the New Testament with the coming of Christ in the Spirit. But once we have the gospel, and once we come to know God and the person and work of His Son, and in our experience of the presence and power of God's Holy Spirit with us and in us, then we see the Trinity everywhere in the Old Testament. Like a person whose vision is clouded and blurry, when we read the Old Testament in isolation, everything appears somewhat cryptic and confused. But when we put on the glasses of the gospel and see the Old Testament through the corrective lenses of Christ and the Spirit, suddenly the whole picture comes into focus and the crisp, sharp image of the Trinity emerges. And this is why we're looking at the book of Joel last week and this week to see how this works. Last week we looked at a passage in chapter 2 of Joel, where God summons the people of Israel to return to Him in full repentance. The people had returned to the land of Israel 
after their exile, but they had not fully returned to Yahweh God in their hearts. They had come back to the land, but not back to God. And so God sends a plague of locusts upon the land to devour the crops as a judgment upon them. And Joel prophesied that the plague of locusts is merely a sign, a little parable from God of the judgment that God has in store next if they will not repent with all their hearts and return to the Lord. God promised, prophesied that he would send an army of warriors to destroy Israel for good. And that day of judgment is called the day of the Lord. Yet, even now, God offered them hope and promised salvation. If they turned back to him fully, he promised to deliver them from the wrath to come on the day of the Lord. And this prophecy of salvation is ultimately fulfilled in Christ, as we saw last week. Christ who takes the judgment upon himself on the cross to accomplish our eternal redemption. In our passage this morning, we come to the promise of the Spirit. The second half of Joel is dominated by three major themes, and these will be our focus today. As we contemplate how these three themes are fulfilled in Christ in the Spirit, we're going to begin to put on those gospel glasses and see our God for who He is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, the first major theme in the second half of Joel, is the return of the Lord. The return of the Lord. Now, before we get there, let's pick up where we left off last week and connect the first half of Joel with the second half. In Joel chapter 2, in our passage last week, verses 15 to 17, the people respond to Joel's preaching, and they call a national day of repentance. And the priests... In verse 17, they cry out to God in prayer. Look at verse 17, chapter 2, verse 17. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? And in chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, God promises to restore the land. He hears their cries. He listens to their prayers, their repentance. And He promises to restore their land and to restore the crops that the locusts had destroyed. Verses 18 and 19. Then the Lord became jealous for His land and had pity on His people. The Lord answered And said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain and wine and oil, and you will be satisfied and will no more, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. God answers their prayer. And he promises to restore the land. And then in chapter 2, verse 20, He promises to spare the people from the coming invasion of this army on the day of the Lord. Verse 20, he says, I will remove the northerner. Now, as a southerner, (laughs) I thought this is prophetic, isn't it? I will remove the northerner. For the Israelites, the northerner represents the coming invader. The foreign nation coming from the north to invade the land. I'm going to remove the invader, the northerner, far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land. His vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise. He's talking about the corpses of this army. 
The stench of them will rise. They will be driven away and defeated. You will have nothing to fear from them when I'm finished with them. Because you have repented and returned to me, the judgment shall pass over you. That's in chapter 2, verse 20. And then in verse 21, God calls the people to worship him for his mighty acts in their behalf. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. So God has answered their prayer. And then from verse 22 up into our passage for this morning in verse 26, God amplifies these promises of restoration, amplifies them up into a prophecy of abundant and supernatural blessing for the land that is to come. And this amplified blessing culminates in verse 27. Look at verse 27. He says, You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no one else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. So what this verse is telling the Israelites is once this restoration begins to take place, once the prophecy is being fulfilled, then you will be able to tell. Then you'll know that I am with you. I am in your midst. I dwell among you. The way the people will know that Yahweh dwells in their midst is when the prophecy comes to pass. And this theme gets picked up again towards the end of the book in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. He says, So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. And Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk. And all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. This abundant supernatural blessing and restoration will accompany God dwelling with his people. Now from this theme, we learn two things. First, God was not dwelling among his people at the time of this prophecy. He says, you shall know that I'm in your midst when this begins to take place. This prophecy wasn't taking place when Joel uttered these words. That's why it's a prophecy. It's out ahead of you. So when these words are penned, when they're uttered by Joel, God is not dwelling among his people at that time. You see, the people had returned to the land, but Yahweh had not yet returned to the land. And that tells you that there is a much deeper dimension to exile than the people imagined. Yeah, geographically they're back from exile. They're not in Babylon or Persia anymore. They've come back. They're in the land. They've rebuilt the capital city of Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the walls. They've rebuilt the temple. The priests are active. The sacrifices are going on. The prayers are being offered. The religious system is up and running again. Praise God. But because the people had not yet returned to God in their hearts, he had not yet returned to his temple. So even though geographically they're back in the land, there's this deeper dimension to exile. They're still far from the presence of God. God has not come back to his temple. He's not in his land. They can rebuild Jerusalem. They can rebuild the temple. But God does not inhabit that temple yet. And he does not dwell with his people. And that means the people are waiting for the return of the Lord. The people are waiting for Yahweh to come back to his temple. Come back from Zion. And when God comes back, then our exile will truly be over. God will be with us again. If they repent and return to the Lord with all their hearts, he promises he will return to them. Second thing we learn from this theme. The people of God were looking forward to the return of the Lord. 
which would usher in the restoration of all things. They were looking ahead. They were looking forward to the return of the Lord. And when he came back, the culmination, the ultimate fulfillment of Joel's words would be nothing less than new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. Remember, he amplifies these promises of restoration. The locusts have wiped out everything. And he's saying, I'm going to bring back everything the locusts ate and destroyed. But then he elevates, modulates that promise up to supernatural new creation. And Joel gives us a little clue of this in chapter 2, verse 22. Look at the verse. He says, Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness. Okay, there aren't any pastures in the wilderness. That's the desert. As my dad once said, there was no grass in the Old Testament. I'm like, Dad, they didn't spend the whole Old Testament in the wilderness. There was some grass. But these are deserts. There's no pasture land in the wilderness, in the desert. But he's saying the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Now, in Hebrew, the verb that gets translated in verse 22 as are green... The pastures of the wilderness are green. That word in Hebrew only shows up one other time in the whole Old Testament. And it shows up right in the middle of the creation account in Genesis 1.11. Here's my translation of Genesis 1.11. God says, let, let plant life grow green. There's our word in Hebrew. Let plant life grow green from the earth. That word grow green is the same thing that's here in our passage as are green. It's the same verb. Only two places it's used. So just as vegetation at the beginning of creation was to grow green at God's command, so God says he will cause even the deserts of Israel to grow green with abundance. This is restoration that is ultimately a return to Eden. Except now Eden's not just a little garden paradise for two people. Now Eden has expanded to encompass all the land. And in the final fulfillment of all things, Eden will be nothing less than a whole new heavens and a whole new earth. Paradise restored. Only better than it ever could have been imagined by Adam and Eve. This is a prophecy of new creation. And it's all connected to the return of the Lord. When the Lord returns, when Yahweh comes back to His temple, to His land, to His people, He is going to bring about new creation. They are looking forward to the return of the Lord when this will happen. And they believed that God would raise up His most special, most mighty, most anointed servant. The mightiest prophet you could imagine. That puts Moses and David and Elijah and Isaiah in the shade. He's so exalted. The servant of the Lord, Isaiah calls him. God's going to send us His ultimate servant. His ultimate prophet. And He will usher in this age of fulfillment. When God will return and all things will be made new. And that's their idea of the Messiah. And when this return happens and the restoration is fulfilled, that is the messianic age. The age of the Messiah. The return of the Lord. Now, according to the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, this promise of the Holy Spirit... In verses 28 and 29 of Joel, the heart of our passage today, this promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter says that was fulfilled on that day on the first Pentecost of the church. On that day of Pentecost in the first century, Peter says what Joel promised and prophesied, the pouring out of the Spirit, that's what's happening right now. 
It's being fulfilled right before your eyes right now. And if that's true, or I should say, since that's true, we don't doubt Scripture's truth, since that's true, then notice what logically follows from verses 27 and 28 of our passage. Look at verses 27 and 28 in sequence. 27, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Meaning verse 27 is first and after verse 27 it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So notice what logically follows. If the pouring out of the Spirit comes afterward, and if the pouring out of the Spirit happened at Pentecost, then that means whatever verse 27 is talking about must have happened before Pentecost. And that means that the return of the Lord and new creation happened before Pentecost. Now, what happened before Pentecost in the New Testament? The coming of Christ, culminating in his death and his resurrection. On that first Easter, and 50 days after Easter, Pentecost. If verses 28 and 29 are fulfilled after verse 27 at Pentecost, then verse 27 must have happened in the coming of Christ. And this is absolutely enormous for your doctrine of God. This means that in the person of Jesus, the man Jesus from Nazareth, fully human like you and me, in the person of Christ, Yahweh, the one who said to Moses from the burning bush, I am that I am. The one true and living God, the maker of all things, that God, Israel's God, Yahweh, returned in the person of Jesus to dwell with his people. Verse 27 says, you shall know that I Yahweh am in the midst of Israel and that I am Yahweh your God and there's none else. I'm the only God there is. And Jesus fulfills that. The return of the Lord, therefore, our first major point here, the return of the Lord is not first and foremost what we think of, the second coming of Jesus. From the Old Testament perspective, the return of the Lord is first and foremost the first coming of Jesus. It's first and foremost about what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that God was in Christ reconciling all things to himself. Or in Colossians 2, God was pleased to have all the fullness of his being to dwell bodily in Jesus. Or as John says, in Christ the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Word who was in the beginning with God and who is God. Jesus is identified as Yahweh. He is fully and equally God with His Father. So that within the one God, Yahweh, there are two persons in relationship to each other. Father and Son. But they're the same God. We're taking our first steps into the mystery of the Trinity. This leads us now to the second major theme in Joel. The day of the Lord. Now we're not going to spend but just a couple of minutes on this point because I want to get to the last point which is the focus of this Sunday, the Holy Spirit. But I just want to say a couple of things about this day of the Lord. Just as there is 
a day of ultimate restoration coming, new heavens, new earth, new creation in the future, Joel emphasizes very clearly there is also an ultimate day of judgment coming in the future. And they're the same day. They're the same day. God coming to judge is fantastic news depending on which side of the line you're on, which team you're on. God coming back to judge means he's going to vindicate his people, rescue them, raise them from the dead, bring them into an eternal kingdom with the Father that never passes away. But if you're on the other side of the line, it is not a day of rejoicing. It is a day of doom and darkness. It's the same day. The day of the Lord will be good news if you believe the gospel, and it will be bad news if you refuse the gospel. But it's all the same day. This ultimate day is coming. Joel chapter 2, verse 30. It says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness. He'll blot out the sun and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Or chapter 3, verses 12 to 15 let the nations stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And in Hebrew, we're just talking about names, right? In Sunday school this morning, that names mean something. They describe something in the Old Testament. Jehoshaphat means the place where Yahweh sits in judgment. The valley of Jehoshaphat is the valley of the place where God sits to judge. And he says, they'll come to the valley of Jehoshaphat because there I will sit to judge. There's a pun in Hebrew. All the surrounding nations will be judged. And then he says, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread for the winepress is full. The vats overflow for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. This is apocalyptic, end of the world imagery. And that day is coming. Second thing I want to say about the day of the Lord. The outpouring of the Spirit in verses 28 and 29 of our passage, it comes between verse 27 the event described in verse 27, and the events described in verses 30 and 31. Which means the days of the Spirit, or the age of the Holy Spirit, covers this whole period between the fulfillment of verse 27 and the fulfillment of verses 30 and 31. In other words, the period between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. This is the day of the Spirit, the age of the Holy Spirit, where He is poured out in a unique way at Pentecost, in a way he wasn't before that. This is what he says in verse 29. In those days I will pour out my Spirit. These are the days of the Spirit. The first coming has happened. The new creation has been launched. Jesus has come. God in our midst. God with us. And he will come again to bring in that great and terrible day at the end. And in the meantime, we have the Holy Spirit with us and in us awaiting that day. So, let's turn now to the final point. The final major theme of the book of Joel is the gift of the Spirit. Let's read again verses 28 and 29. The prophet says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Notice first of all in this passage, that it is God's Spirit that will be poured out. And if it's God's Spirit, then this Spirit must be fully God. God doesn't have a Spirit that's not divine. 
That wouldn't make any sense. You have a spirit that's human. You're a human being. You have a human spirit because you have a human nature. You're human top to bottom. God is divine from top to bottom. So if God has a spirit, it's got to be just as much God as he is. And that's the gift he gives us. He pours it out upon us. And it must only be a gift. In the New Testament, there's a Simon Magus, a magician. He sees Paul doing miracles by the Holy Spirit. And he says, let me offer you some money so you can teach me. I'll be your apprentice. You can teach me how to do the miracles you're doing by the Holy Spirit. And he says, the Holy Spirit's not for sale. He's a gift. You don't purchase him. He is given freely. He, God pours out his divine spirit as a pure gift of love to us. And so now notice the distinction. God has a fully divine spirit that he shares with us. There's God. He has a spirit and he shares it with you. They're both fully God, but there's a distinction made between them. They're the same God, but they're not the same person. So within God, within Yahweh, the one God, there is Father and Son, and now there's this third person, the Holy Spirit. And we really come to know who He is as a distinct, individual, unique person in our experience of the gospel, as Jesus pours out His Spirit upon us, as the Father sends the Spirit to be with us and in us, we come to know this third person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now we are well on our way to coming to know the Trinity. Notice this. In in verses 28 and 29, all of God's people receive the Spirit. All of God's people receive receive the Spirit. He says that your sons and your daughters, so male and female, your old men and your young men, so all ages, both genders, all ages, even on the male and female servants, free people, servants, every class division. You see, he's breaking down all the divisions, male and female, old and young, servant and free, all the class divisions, all the distinctions, just the walls between them just come crumbling down. And you all get the Spirit. He's just opening up a fire hose of the Holy Spirit and He is just dousing all of you indiscriminately. Everybody gets the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, only prophets get the, get the Holy Spirit in a special way. The Spirit comes upon a prophet and inspires him to prophesy. But this isn't something that happens to everybody. It's a unique gift to specific people. But in the coming of the Spirit, after the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, when the Pentecost day comes, the fire falls on everybody. No distinctions are made. And that is why everybody in verse 28 will be prophesying. Everybody gets to prophesy. Everybody's going to dream a dream. Everybody's going to see a vision. Now, he doesn't mean literally everyone's going to be, be having dreams and visions and stuff like that. He just means to say he lists all these different ways that God reveals his word to his prophets in the Old Testament. Dreams, visions, you name it. All the different ways in the Old Testament God reveals his word to his servants, the prophets, he's going to be revealing his word to you, his people. All of you, all of you will be able to communicate God's word to one another. You know, we often talk about the, the, uh, the priesthood of all believers. Have you heard of that before? The priesthood of all believers. That means that all of us can go before God without needing a human mediator. We can all go right to God in prayer because we have Christ as our mediator. I don't need a priest in a box, right, to go to God. We talk about the priesthood of all believers. Joel's prophesying the prophethood of all believers. That all of you will be able to speak God's word to one another. 
because the Spirit will be with you. All of you will be able to communicate and speak, thus says the Lord, to one another. One last point about the Holy Spirit. If all of you are able to speak the Word of God to one another, what is that Word that you will speak? What is the Word the Spirit empowers you to proclaim? Answer, it's the Gospel. It's the Gospel. And that's what happened at Pentecost, wasn't it? The Spirit is poured out upon the apostles in the upper room, the 120, and they go downstairs and they start preaching the Gospel to everybody. Jesus says, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, the gift of the Spirit promised by the Father, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The prophethood of all believers, you will be able to go and be a witness for the Lord all over this earth. You will be able to speak the words of the gospel. Thus says the Lord, and out of your mouth comes gospel. The Spirit is poured out upon the whole church. And Paul says we are the temple of God. The Spirit dwells with us. The Spirit is here. God dwells in the midst of His people through the Holy Spirit. He is in you and He is with you. He dwells with His people. You are not in exile anymore. You have been brought back to God. He has parted the sea and brought you with a mighty deliverance to himself and given you his very self in the person of the Spirit to be with you forever. Yahweh God, the one God, the only God there is, dwells with his people in his church and through you he is building his church and calling his elect to himself to turn to him with all of our hearts before that day of the Lord finally comes. The last verses of our passage, verses 31 and 32 says, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The apostle Paul quotes that in Romans 10 and he says the the Lord that everyone calls upon, Yahweh in Hebrew, that's Jesus. And the everyone is everybody in this world, Jew and Gentile, no distinctions. This is a prophecy of the gospel. This is a prophecy of the salvation we have in Jesus. And when we put on this gospel and we look through it, at who God is in the Old Testament, we see that there is one God, Yahweh. But within the one God, there is Father, there is Son, and there is Holy Spirit. In this gospel, the Trinity is plainly revealed. But how how in the world do we make sense of all this? How can there be three persons who are fully God and yet there's just one God? How do we put this together? How do you make sense of this? This profound mystery. Well, to see the sense that it makes, to put it all together, we need the New Testament, and we need another sermon next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who is with us and in us. And we thank you so much that when we have your Holy Spirit, we do not have a second-rate deity. We do not have a second-class God. We have the one, true, only, infinite, glorious, mighty, breathtaking, incredible God in the person of the Holy Spirit. And when we have the Spirit, we have all of you. We thank you that you do not hold anything back from us. You give us all that you are and all that you have through your Son and through your Spirit. And we thank you that you sent your Son to take upon himself our nature and our brokenness and to heal us from the inside out, to purchase our perfect and eternal redemption. 
and then to send your Holy Spirit to apply that redemption to us, to be with us and in us, sanctifying us, helping us, encouraging us, strengthening us, caring for us, leading us and guiding us, inspiring your praises in our hearts, opening our eyes to see and our minds to understand and our hearts to love and changing our wills to go and obey all that you've called us to do. We thank you, O God, that you have wrapped yourself around each of us with your love, with your power, and with your glory. And we worship you today, the one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray these things for your glory. Amen. Amen.